I'm Helena Norberg-Hodge, and I direct an organization called ISEC, the International Society for Ecology and Culture. And for about 35 years, I've been trying to raise awareness about the way in which the economy, economic development, globalization, lies behind almost all the social and environmental crises we face. And I'm so happy to be able to interview Doug Tompkins, who I think is possibly the most influential environmentalist in the world today. He has been putting 100% of his energy and his, a sizable part of his money, which is very considerable, into trying to save this earth of ours. And he's been at it for two decades now. So we're talking today about strategies to save the earth. What do you say to people who say, what can we do? They feel hopeless, depressed by all the crises around them. What do you think is the most important thing they can do? Well, I keep saying to especially young people that they have to do their homework, they have to do their scholarship, and uh, inform themselves of the you know, mess that we find ourselves, or the crisis that we find ourselves. And then out of that, um, we'll start to emerge um, clarity of, of a vision and what, where somebody can take up their, their uh, place along a long front to, to try to reverse the, these negative trends and so forth. And I would also add to that that when you start looking at it from a bigger picture, you start seeing that a lot of issues converge in the same root causes, so then it makes it easier to look at strategic activism that can have a systemic change. Yeah, I think you have to understand the substantive issues, and then from that, those the understanding of the substantive issues inform the activism. And as, uh, as you say, narrows down the uh, the options so that you don't have a scattershot approach, and you're wasting a lot of time and a lot of energy on things that are not going to come to much. Yeah, and also very often, if you're just treating symptoms, you can sometimes actually reinforce the system. So it's quite important that you don't just look at things in a shallow way. And generally, the information we're getting in the media and in academia is encouraging a very shallow approach. And that's why the crises are continuing to multiply and people feel more and more overwhelmed. So getting to the roots and looking more deeply is just fundamental. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you end up uh, stopping the, the, uh, the, the driving forces that are, you know, creating the crisis in the first place instead of putting out fires. So, if you're interested in putting out fires, well, then you can put patches on things all over, but it's a, a short-sighted, I think, and a, uh, ultimately futile attempt because the fires will just be springing up until they become uncontrollable. And so, don't you agree that one of the major root causes is the economic system and that we need to be looking yeah. at that? I, I go so far as um, to say that we have to eliminate capitalism itself, C certainly mega-capitalism as a, as a mega-technology, seen as a mega-technology. Um, and I think uh, it would be wise to try to, to reform an economic system prior to um, uh, getting so entrenched that it collapses on its own weight with all sorts of unforeseen and catastrophic consequences. Yeah, so that's another, I think, important point. A lot of people say, well, it's going to collapse anyway, so we don't need to think about it. And in fact, it would be a lot better if we could focus on the need for change and look at the key levers that could, that could bring the economy in a direction that will support life, support our water systems, the land, and help to rebuild the fabric of society. And that, that means looking at the way in which deregulating global trade and finance is responsible for most of the social and ecological destruction we see. And so we need to be looking at re-regulating finance and trade. And one of the things we can do is start already at the local level to create protected local markets where producers and consumers collaborate to create a new economy that really supports diversity. Well, you have a, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a, an economy that's based on the, on the concept of 
of continual growth. Um, it's a dogma that's absolutely fixed as in stone, almost a blind religious faith to it. And they, uh, uh, you can practically pick up 99 people out of 100 when you sit them down and ask them if uh, it's possible to have infinite growth on a finite planet, we'll tell you no. But um, they cannot see the possibility of changing the systems too, too large, too entrenched, too overwhelming. Uh, they feel unempowered and so forth. But if we simply remember that the system was created by people, um, we're another generation of people. Um, we're perfectly capable of changing it into something that's not going to destroy the ecosphere which it's been doing, as we see in such things as the extinction crisis and global climate change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say exactly what Doug said, is that perhaps the most important idea is to realize that we're dealing with a man-made economic system. It's not evolutionary. It's not happening out of some natural progression that things just get bigger and bigger and bigger. In nature, everything that waxes also wanes. Uh, we're not talking about evolution, we're not talking about something natural, it's very unnatural, made by people, and we can change it. And we just need to have the courage to look at the bigger picture, uh, and, and the courage to realize that we are um, capable of changing a man-made system. I'm in 100% accord with that.